There is work to be done in improving relationships between law enforcement and the people they are paid to protect and serve. Is community policing the answer? These programs have been in place in many Oklahoma communities for a few years now, and they appear to be effective. But can they be improved and expanded? That's the topic of a two-part in-depth conversation with Susan Cadeau and her guests. Thank you, Rich. Yes, we at In-Depth are continuing our look at racism in Oklahoma and all the facets in between of how we move forward. We have three very special guests joining us today to talk about this, in particular, community policing, and I'd like to introduce them to you. First, we have Reverend Cherie Dickerson. She is the founder and executive director of Black Lives Matter Oklahoma, among many things that she does for the community in Oklahoma City and the state of Oklahoma. We have Hannibal Johnson, who is an attorney, author, and independent consultant specializing in diversity and inclusion and cultural competence issues and nonprofit governance. And then we have Chief Brandon Claves with the Midwest City Police Department, who comes to us uh, 40 years of experience, uh, FBI training, Secret Service training, uh, to add into the mix as we talk about today, community policing. Quite an impressive panel, and again, thank you all for being with us today. Well, I'd like to begin with uh, Chief Claves. First of all, from a police law enforcement point of view, give us a definition. What is community policing? Well, you know, we have a mission statement and, and recently we added a vision statement to, to support our mission statement. Our mission statement is pretty simple. It says the Midwest City Police Department is to provide law enforcement services, education and leadership through community policing. Well, part of that vision is, is that we're going to do that through partnerships with the community, communication, trust, accountability, which is very important innovation, compassion, and understanding, and mutual respect and equality and diversity within our community. And you know, I, I want to talk about Midwest City. I've been here for 42 years, been very blessed to be the police chief here for 21 years. We have a diverse population. I have 28% African-American population in Midwest City. I tell everybody we're a little big city. We're no different than Oklahoma City and Tulsa as far as what our makeup is. And so our issues that we deal with are different than other cities around the community. So we've got had to be very aggressive with community-based policing, which actually started in 1999. And it's been a long transition for us. It's a cultural change among law enforcement officers. I've worked with six decades of police officers, officers who worked in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now 2010s and 2020s. And so we're all different within the, within the law enforcement agency and through our community. So it's been a, a movement. It, it's not been a, a revolution. It's been an evolution for us, but it's all embraced by our officers, which in turn has created a better community for us. Reverend Dickerson, what is your idea of community policing? I identify more as um, probably um, a radical and abolitionist, but for from the lens of community policing, it would mean that those in law enforcement um, have relationship and understand um, the needs and the people who are in the community um, that they are able, that they are actually assigned to. And so we would just see that they would see those that they are protecting and serving um, as, as their neighbor. And they would recognize um, the individual needs or concerns of, of the members in that community. Reverend, have you staying with you, have you seen any progress maybe in the past year, uh, especially since uh, the murder of George, George Floyd, have you seen more effort from law enforcement organizations or no? I won't say that I haven't seen any effort um, one of the issues that we're constantly advocating for is for our law enforcement agencies to acknowledge that there is an issue, that they are working with the issues of racism and bias and lack of knowledge of their com the communities that they serve. And so I do see a few that um, they tell us what they're trying to implement, but they're not acknowledging um, what the core needs um, the core needs that needs to be changed. Okay, Mr. Johnson, I want to come to you kind of as someone who has studied these issues uh, down the decades and the chief has, has seen it on the law enforcement side. Why is there that innate trust? And is it some, I'm assuming it's not something that can be fixed overnight. Do you think we're on the right path? Do you think, do you see a repetition of the history that you know so well? Um, um, is there a halfway point where everyone needs to meet? There's a lot of work to be done, there's no doubt about that. Um, when I think about community policing, I think, as Reverend Dickerson 
pointed out, for, for me, it, it, it's in part about reciprocity. It's about understanding that it's beneficial for both the community and the police to build relationships and trust. The police need the community to do their core mission, which is solve crime. The community need the police to keep them safe and secure. So building those bonds through having actual relationships between real people is important. And trust is something that takes takes a, a long time to, to be gained, but can be lost in a moment. In Tulsa, for example, we think of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre during which there's no dispute that the, the police deputized the mob that destroyed the community. There's no question about that. Our former police chief, Chuck Jordan, actually issued a public apology about seven or eight years ago on behalf of the police department for its dereliction of duty back in 1921. So those historical wounds, if left to fester, can destroy trust. So we have to, again, as Reverend Dickerson pointed out, acknowledge that there have been fractures in these relationships. That's the first step. And then we build on that. We do like the Tulsa Police Department, for example, has incorporated implicit bias training in its academies for the last couple of years. That's really important. Chief, you talked about all, all, all the ways that uh, your department is working to make sure that that gap, that break is at least moving towards healing. Can you talk about in depth about some of the things uh, incorporating, uh, what, what did you call it, uh, Mr. Johnson, the, the, heal, the, the last program you mentioned? Implicit bias training? Yeah, do, do you have that? What does that look like in your department? Because you do have a varied um, population there in Midwest City. And I know we can't compare all police agencies to one another. Everyone is going to be different in some measure as, as to what they're doing. But when we look at the state of Oklahoma, only 8% of the total population is African American, but 27% of the state's prison population uh, is also African American. Is there a basis, a good foundation for the mistrust? And what what are you doing specifically? I know you've already mentioned, but kind of go in depth as to what you want to see happen with your department to address those issues. Well, let me talk about a few things that Cherie and, and Hannibal have spoken about. First of all, I, I believe that from our, our perspective, my police department perspective, we realize there's issues within this community, within the state of Oklahoma and across the United States. And we believe that there is implicit biases. And, you know, there's always to talk about racism. I think there's racism in every cult culture, but we know there's implicit bias and we do have implicit bias training. If we understand what those are and we have a better way of communicating with the public that we're supposed to serve and understand how they in interpret our actions and our beliefs, and we do the same with them. You know, I have a police community advisory board. We were the second agency in the state of Oklahoma to implement the police community advisory board, which in turn provides me information on what we need to do to make our community better. And uh, I agree with uh, Cherie and Hannibal. Trust is the number one issue. I walk the streets of Midwest City where we have our highest violent crime rates. I've gone to the neighbors door to door and spoken with them. And there's a lot of good people living in Midwest City. But there's also some bad people in Midwest City. It's just like bad police officers. I'm not disputing that there's bad police officers in the organization who do bad things, just like anybody else. But it is an honorable profession. I would say 99.9% .9 of people that work in law enforcement do the best job that they can. And I want to talk real briefly. You know, we've got a great relationship with our religious community, our African-American community. Uh, youth are extremely important. And we need to framework what, what the issues are within our community. And we've done that face-to-face -face conversations. But I do have some alarming statistics, and I'd like for Cherie and, and Hannibal to maybe comment on this. And, you know, you've thrown out some stats about Oklahoma and people incarcerated. You know, there's 328 million people in, in the United States. The latest numbers I saw, 41.4% are African Americans. And that's 12.6% of our population. But that 12.6% is committing about 50% of our violent crime in the United States. That's concerning to me, not only as a police chief, but as a person, as a human being, why is that occurring? Why are we not drilling down to figure out what is causing that? I know in Midwest City, we have some areas where low socioeconomic income, we have single family parents, we have grandparents raising grandparents' kids, but those numbers are the concerning thing to me. And, you know, we talk about 
police officers killing unarmed black uh, Americans, African Americans. That's a small number, which is a small percentage. But the real concerning number for me is 93% of homicides committed are committed by African Americans on African Americans. And we see that in Midwest City. I've had a, 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 an increase in homicides this year in violent crimes because of the pandemic, and it's all across the United States. But we need to understand why is this occurring? And I don't disagree. We do a really good job with crisis intervention, mental health training. We do a great job with implicit bias. We do a great job with de-escalation training. We're trying to do all the things that our community expects from us. But the bottom line is we respect the people we serve. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. We're human beings. But we're not the only ones that make mistakes. So why don't we look at those issues and find out why is that occurring? And that's, that would be my challenge. Reverend, do you want to address that? Um, well, I would, um, and I have a, a, a we, me and uh, Chief Claves have a rapport, and we have um, been on panels together and and spoken. And so, in uh, rebuttal, um, we have to be um, honest about the fact that most crimes that happen happen within the same racial um, demographic or ethnicity. So. White people are the ones that commit crimes against white people. Those that are AAPI communities committed against themselves. And so it's unfair to only highlight um, or make it seem like um, it is that there is um, a higher percentage within African-American communities when it is basically the same in all communities. And let me just add, um, the, the, the other thing that that statement ignores is the, the fact that we have institutional systemic bias. So th there have been numerous scholarly studies that indicate that Black people are treated less favorably at every phase of the criminal justice process. So to say that Black people cre commit a, this sort of disproportionate number of crimes is to fail to acknowledge that black people are more likely to be stopped, charged, convicted, sentenced for longer terms, and for many years sentenced for similar crimes in, in a very disproportionate way. Consider crack and powder cocaine, for example, is the is is the is kind of the, the, the banner example of that. So we have bias at every stage of the criminal justice process. And I, I do say that acknowledging that I work directly with the police department here. So, so I know that it's not just about the police. It's about the criminal justice system writ large. And the problems are structural. Um, they're rooted in racism from the very beginning. And it, it's going to take all of us working together to solve. It. Chief, do you have a, a rebuttal to that? Oh, I, I enjoy the, the conversation. You know, I'm responding to the statistics that you that you uh, have indicated to me. And so I don't disagree with the comments made by Sheree. And, and I want to actually thank her for the relationship that we have. She's helped me on some issues here in the metro area in Oklahoma City area. We do have a good relationship. I've not met Hannibal before, but he's obviously very educated, uh, very well spoken. And I don't disagree with his comments either. But you know, it's, it's a wide variety of issues that we have to look at together. And, you know, we have to we have to frame what are we facing together? And that's what that's my issue as police chief. I don't serve just one group or one culture. I serve the entire community, which is a diverse community. So I understand the issues that we're talking. So let me ask this. When we're talking about we want the police department to, to relate to, to understand, to have relationships with the citizenry it, it patrols, to get to know the neighborhood. I have a friend who's an Oklahoma City police officer. He's African-American. He stays in the same neighborhood. He gets to know the people there. Um, he also works with youth in Oklahoma City. He used to be community outreach before he went back to street patrol, working with uh, the kiddos there that were considered, you know, at risk. Um, so I know the effort is going on there, but how do you, there's a, there's that mistrust. I, I, people, uh, anyone gets scared when there's a police officer behind them. I have friends who are black who say, no, they have an innate fear like they could be pulled out of the car. They have to do everything right. I don't know how you get rid of that fear. It's going to take uh, years, I think, Chief. Don't you think? How do you get rid of that fear? Through uh, positive conversation. You know, I think it starts with the family unit. And, uh, you know, we have to actually put out a flyer. I'm going to show this to you. 
it's how to uh, interact with the police department. And, you know, I would expect when I was raised, I knew what to do if I was stopped by a police officer. But there are some people who don't know how to interact with police departments. And so, you know, those conversations need to be taking place in the family unit. The other issue that we have is if you if you if people will just comply with our with our commands and if they have a complaint, contact the supervisor immediately. You know, we all of our officers are outfitted with body cameras and in-car cameras. It's important for us to be transparent. But a lot of these issues that you see on national TV and locally where someone is shot and killed, the biggest issue is they didn't comply. Now, there are issues, I understand, where there is questionable reasons as why an officer shot their weapon. You know, I have to I have to base it on the facts and circumstances of that case. I'm not here to talk about any other police agency but Midwest City. I know that we are trying to be as transparent as possible. So, uh, Hannibal... Is there some responsibility on the other side, on the community side, to also work with police departments? Um, I know many uh, black parents are having that conversation with their kiddos, right, of, of how to interact, but is there something that is inherent that's not being done on the community side to also understand and relate to police officers? There absolutely is. I mean, I, I think one of the things I've been working with the police department here for the last dozen years or so is building trust, they're building these relationships. And part of the building the relationships has to do with demystifying policing. What, what do police do and, and why? How can we relate to police in a way that diffuses rather than intensifies particular situations? Well, clearly there is much to discuss and I know we'll be getting together. I thank you all for your time and for your insight. Excellent dialogue. And we will bring you part two of this conversation next Friday on the Oklahoma News Report.